Well, Redemption Church, here we are. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry I can't be with you live, um, but I'm believing this virus thing will be over soon and I'll be able to come to see you face to face. Pastor Joshua, Tara, hi, and thank you for uh, the privilege of ministering again into the life of your church. And um, some of you may remember uh, when I've come to speak to you, I've talked a lot about the keys to longevity. And uh, I honestly believe that there is an attack, there is a plan, a design, a scheme from hell um, um, to attack longevity in the ministry and in our lives as we try to work out our destiny as Christians. And over the past few months, uh, I have been meditating a lot on how God's grace has kept me to this point. 40 years in the ministry, and I'm still as passionate now as I was when I first, um, when I first got saved. And uh, I've been reviewing God's history in my life and his grace in my life, especially in connection to longevity. And... What I want to speak to you about today is very important. I'm going to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit um, just to focus on what he wants to say to the church there, Redemption Church there. And, and very often uh, when I come to you, my relationship with you always seems to be with a prophetic edge to it. Um, and, I, um, uh, and I believe this message today, although it will be helpful and encouraging uh, and pastoral, there will also be, I believe, a prophetic edge to it as, um, as we seek to move forward in our destiny um, as a church. Uh, I want to talk to you about something which I call the space between. That phrase has captured my heart for the last few months, and I've been studying it, meditating it, the space between. And I believe one of the keys to longevity in our lives as ministers and Christians is knowing how to negotiate the space between. The space between the promise and the fulfillment, the space between the promise from God and what the Bible terms as the fullness of time. So whenever God gives you a promise, whenever God gives you a vision of, or, 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 of your future, or uh, whenever he speaks to your heart about your destiny, uh, there's always a space between, and there's always a fullness of time for that promise or dream or aspect of your destiny to come to pass. For instance, God gave Eve a promise in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. He said, Eve, what's coming from your womb will crush the enemy's head. So the promise was given in Genesis chapter 3 15, but watch this. The fullness of time for that promise took 3,000 years. So the space between the promise and the fullness of time was the Old Testament. And if, if we are going to finish strong, if we are going to continue passionate and on fire for God for the duration of our destiny, we have to understand that we need to negotiate the space between the promise and the fulfillment. The promise and the fullness of time. And I tell you right now, whatever promise God has given you, there is a fullness of time. And you need to understand and you need to um, have a revelation on how to negotiate the space between the promise and the fullness of time. For David, it was 17 years from the anointing oil flowing on his face 
to sitting on the throne as king of Israel, the space between took 17 years. For Joseph, when God gave him the dream, we all know the story. But from the inception of the dream to the fulfillment of that dream, to the fullness of time for that dream, it took Joseph 12 years. The space between was 12 years. And what about Abraham? Abraham was promised a son from God. And between the promise and the fullness of time, Isaac being born, took 25 years. <laughs> and knowing how to deal with the space between is vital if we are going to finish strong. And what I love about the Bible, when you read the Old Testament and the New Testament, God, when you, when you look at the lives of God's servant as they walk out the space between, we can learn so much. And we can be encouraged also. And I look at David and I look at <clears throat> Abraham and I look at, at Joseph and many, many others on how they negotiated that space between. And I notice God doesn't hide the failures and the frustrations of his servants as they negotiated the space between. They, they experienced self-doubt. Have I really heard from God? They experienced great discouragement. David, on one occasion, was so discouraged, he, he was almost at the point of taking his life. He, um, uh, he was, uh, you know, sort of wondering, did I, was I imagining that? Uh, is, is it just my pride? Is it my arrogance? And so, uh, you know, Many of them experience discouragement, some of them hopelessness. And, and Abraham even used manipulation <laughs> to bring the promise to pass because he became impatient during the space between. So listen, some of you are there, I know as I'm speaking. Some of you are there. When is God going to fulfill that promise to me? And you are right in the middle, you're, in, you're, you're, in, you're living the space between, and, and you have days when self-doubt is raging, when your mind is full of fear, when you're beating yourself up, when you sometimes don't want to get out of bed, you, hopelessness attacks you without mercy. Well, listen, be encouraged. Be encouraged because all of God's servants, between the promise and the fulfillment of the promise, from the dream to the fulfillment of that dream, experience the same thing. And there's a reason for that. But I want to say this to you. <laughs> Based on the word of God and my own personal experience, however long or however confusing or however tragic or painful that space between is, one thing I am absolutely 100% sure of, what God has started in your life, he will bring to completion. Watch this. The completion of your destiny basically is not dependent upon your faithfulness. <laughs> because some of you right now look at your history and thinking faithfulness is far from the story. It's not about your faithfulness. It's not about your grip on him. But it's all about his faithfulness to fulfill what he promised. And it's all about his grip on you. Every promise, for every promise, for every dream, for every vision... God has given you, there is a fullness of time. So knowing how to negotiate that space between the promise and the fullness of time is essential to finish in strong. And when I started to meditate on this phrase, the space between, 
you could use a number of words to describe it. Uh, one could be transition, uh, the process of changing from one season to another. We could use gestation, the space between conception and birth. We could use germination, the space between the planting of the seed and the harvest. We could, we could call it fermentation, the space between the crushed grape and the wine. <laughs> And nobody likes the crushing. And can I just put that? I'm going ahead of myself here, but let me say to you, God is not necessarily after fruit in your life. He's after wine. <laughs> Let that sink in. And between the fruit and the wine is the ferment, the crushing and the fermentation, the space between. And some of you are there right now. It seems life is overwhelming you, and it seems like you're in a vice and you're wondering what's going on. Be encouraged. That fruit that has been developed in you, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and faith. That fruit that's taken years to grow in your life, and now you think, what is going on in my life? I feel crushed. Things are not going right. I feel overwhelmed. Cheer up. Listen, you are in the space between fruitfulness and wine. And, uh, oh, man, I... I I, yeah, I'm going to move on because I could get stuck there. So, so, okay, another word that we could use would be incubation. The space between underdevelopment and healthy growth. So, whatever term you use, in the working out of our destiny, we will have to endure the space between. And on reflection... Uh, as I look at my own life and, and, and studying God's word on this subject, I've got to say this to you. And I know, uh, I know when you're going through it, it doesn't make sense. But I've discovered that God's greatest work in our lives is achieved during the space between. Because it's not just about arriving it's not just about being king of Israel. It's not just about being prime minister of Egypt. It's not just giving, uh, having Isaac from whose uh, uh, line Jesus came. No, it's a bit more than that. You see, we are more concerned about who we become. But God is more concerned about who we are becoming. You can become famous in two minutes these days. Just go on YouTube and there's a load of people. They have instant fame. Uh, but the reason why they can't maintain it is because they have no character to, to sustain that fame. So the space between is where character is formed. Character is not gifted. I may be gifted to preach. I may be gifted to communicate and sing. But I'm not gifted to live. So the space between is where God creates character. You see, reputation is what you become. Character is who you are becoming. Reputation is who you are before men. But your character is who you are before God. And the church is not a supermarket where fruit is displayed. Hey, look at me. No. From God's perspective, the church is a field where fruit is grown, where wine is produced. So the space between God's doing more in you. In fact, the space between is where patience is developed. Oh, you know, we've heard the phrase, God, I want patience and I want it now. It don't work like that. James chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing. See, that's the key. When you understand, when you know why. 
when you know the reason for the space between, that gives you the, the, the courage to endure it. So count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work. <laughs> In other words, stick it out. That you may be perfect, lacking nothing. And in Hebrews 6, chapter 12, I love this verse. Watch this in context with what I'm saying. Imitate those who, through faith, yeah, watch, and patience, inherit the promise. So it's not just having faith to believe the promise. It's having the patience to endure the space between in order for the promise to have its fullness of time. And the space between is where trust is forged. Lord, help me to trust you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Do you know what trust is? Trust is faith plus nothing. That's what trust is. another level. But the space between is where trust is forged. And I've shared this with you on a number of occasions. But uh, I ask God, I ask God, what does it mean to trust you? And this, this is what he said to me. He said, Ray, if you want to really trust me, then you have to surrender your desire to know why. And I, I remember speaking to the staff about sometimes we find ourselves in an unplanned place of destiny. Somebody else's decision has caused your mess. And you're in a situation you never planned to be. You never planned to be bankrupt. You never planned to be divorced. You never planned to be sick. You never planned to be betrayed. But it happens. And you don't know why. You said, Lord, I've been serving you. I'm doing what is right. And yet this disaster has happened in my life. And I find myself in a place I never planned to be. And some of you may be there right now. Listen, don't fight it. Don't, don't, don't get to the place where you, where you think, that's it, I'm done. No, God is perfecting, God is creating a perfect environment in your life right now for you to develop trust. Hmm. And those are the times you surrender your desire to know why, because that is where trust is forged. And I want to just stop here, I want to just stop here, camp around here for a moment. Because, because of this pandemic, and because of this virus, and because of this unplanned place uh, of destiny here, some of you are really worried about your future. You're worried about your job. You're worried about your relationships. You're worried about your destiny. How is God going to fulfill that promise to me uh, when everything has just gone south? Everything has just gone completely opposite. To, no, listen to me. This is so important. <clears throat> I read a story of a man, and he was visiting England, and he was a historian. And he wanted to visit the new college in Oxford. It's an amazing place, has an amazing history. And he went to visit in 1990, and he was being shown around the complex. And he asked the guide, how old is this college? And the guide said, well, it was actually built in 1386. 1386 to 1390. And he says, wow, what, a, what? That's a long time. That's like 600 odd years old. And he was walking around the big hall and he looked up at, and he, his, his attention was, was focused on the massive oak beams that supported this heavy roof. And the span of the beams were quite incredible. And he, and he looked and he asked the guy, he said, wow, he said, he said, are they the original beams, 600 years old? And the guy says, no, no, uh, the, the beams of the roof were actually replaced 100 years ago in 1890. 
So those beams are not 600 years old, they're just a hundred years old. Um, so in 1890, after 500 years, he said the old beams, the original beams needed replacing because they couldn't, they could no longer support the weight of the roof. The problem was when, when they came to replace the beams, nobody knew of oak trees big enough and strong enough to make the beams to replace the roof. So we had a problem. But he says, but he says, but the college forester knew something that other people didn't know. Because behind the college, there was a stand of great majestic oak trees. And they were nearly 600 years old. They were 550 years old. And they were planted by the very person that, that constructed the roof originally. So the same guy that constructed the roof using those beams in 1390 planted this stand of oaks hidden behind the college. Uh, uh, and, and he said, well, why did he do that? And this is so powerful. And, and the guide said, well, you see, this man had great insight. He knew ahead of time, way ahead of time, that the strength of the original beams would weaken over time. And he realized they would last maybe four or five hundred years. And later they would need replacing. So knowing that, he planted, he had the foresight to plant replacements. <laughs> and I read that story, I thought, this guy had the foresight to plant replacements knowing that in 500 years' time, uh, the original beams would not be able to support the weight of the roof. <laughs> Those 500 years, the space between 1390 and 1890 were used to prepare the material for future crisis. I want this to sink in. You're way ahead of me. You know exactly when I'm going to go with this. Some of you are worried about the future. Some of you are worried about what's going to happen in the future. No, listen. <laughs> Man, we have a heavenly forester. God has already prepared in advance what you will need for your future crisis. He planned ahead. He knows the end from the beginning. The joy, he knows the joy that you need when life has stolen your song. He knows the love that you need when someone has broken your heart. He knows the peace that you need when the storms of circumstance threaten your life. And the verse that encapsulated it for me was in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and it says this, For we are his workmanship. He created us, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, here it is, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And I'm prophesying to somebody right now that's concerned about their future. No, listen, for every unbearable weight that will face you in the future, for every trial, for every heartbreak, for every tragedy or disaster or storm or loss, God has already prepared what you need to sustain you through those times. And you know the amazing thing is, excuse me, air guitar, because I'm excited now. There's nobody in the building here, so it's just me and the Holy Ghost and, I'm, and you listening. Watch this. You know, God has even prepared for your unfaithfulness. This is wild. 
He's even prepared for your unfaithfulness, your backsliding, and your rebellion. Seriously. Jonah is a classic example. Call a God on his life. Go to Nineveh. No, I'm not. And he went on holiday, jumped in a ship. He was running away from God. Total rebellion. But you see, you see, you, you see, Jonah's unfaithfulness was not going to thwart the plan of God. God was in control. So here's Jonah running in the opposite direction to his destiny. But it says in the book of Jonah, now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. <laughs> I've been in that fish. Man, when I wanted to give up and run away, I've been in that fish. And some of you are in that fish right now. You want to run away from the call of God. You want to run away from what God's called for you. No, listen. You're in the fish. What's going on here? And when I was a kid, you know, when I was younger, they used to, I used to listen to, um, you know, Sunday school stories about Jonah. And they'd show me pictures. And I see Jonah sitting in the whale with a table and a candle. No, it wasn't like that at all. And in some of the modern ones, he had a TV. No, <coughs> Jonah was sitting in the fish for three days up to his neck in digestive juices. That thing wanted to digest him. And there were only two ways out of that fish. <laughs> there was that way and there was that way. And I know which way I want to go. And you know what? The, the, the key to Jonah getting back on course was, uh, the Bible says that when he realized, hey, you know, I can't run away from the call of God. I can't get away from this. God's chosen me and, it, and, and that's it. He's going to finish what he started. So the Bible says that in the fish, Jonah offered up a song of thanksgiving and the fish spewed him out back on course. Man, I love this stuff, man. I really do. I really do. And I want to say to you right now, those of you that are worried about your future, the same grace that carried you through past crisis is the same grace that sustains you in your present crisis. And it's the same grace already prepared. I call it, one guy has called it future grace. He's already prepared it. Hmm. So the space between is where character is formed, where patience is developed, and where trust is forged. And, um, you know, I, I've got, there's so much stuff here, so I'm, I'm just trying to focus. Uh, I'm just asking the Holy Ghost just to focus on what he really wants to say. And um, I, 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 I've tried to make this very practical, and uh, in my study and in my meditation, I, I believe that during the working out of your destinies, we will experience the space between in various ways. For instance, um, you will experience nights. Nighttime. The nighttime um, is the space between p.m. and a.m. Nighttime is the space between sunset and sunrise. It's dark, and I, I, if I got time, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go into that. Um, but there's another. Uh, let me just let me just focus on this one f for the moment. See if I can get it done here. Um, you will experience, during the space between, you will experience valleys. The space between two mountains, okay? You will experience valleys. Um, I call that, um, and, and, and I'm sure this is going to uh, be relevant to many of you here listening to my voice right now. Valleys. I believe, and I call it the space between a broken dream, and a hopeless future. Let that sink in. Imagine being between a broken dream, 
and a hopeless future. And I, as I'm speaking, I believe that some, some of you are there right now. Let me explain. Because when I was thinking about this, I thought of the disciples um, in the upper room. Imagine this. They were in the upper room. And they were so excited because they realized, while well, we are getting close now to when Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. And, and in fact, they were so excited, they started to argue amongst themselves who was the greatest. I mean, you know, Peter would say, John, I, I think I'm going to get a better position than you because, you know, you know, who was the only one that got out of the boat and walked on the water? <clears throat> and they were comparing their achievements together and they were arguing amongst themselves who was the greatest and you know Jesus washed their feet but but the, the point I'm trying to make is they were on a high man they were up there they were wow this is exciting and then Jesus Jesus shattered their dreams by telling them hey listen guys it's not going to work out the way you thought. And I can imagine them looking at him and thinking, what? What are you talking about? Well, we're going to go from here. <clears throat> and we're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm going to be arrested. And I'm going to be tortured. And I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed. And immediately... Their minds were whir whirling. What? Well, I did try to. T I, I, I have, and Jesus said, "Well, I, I have been, you know, you know, sort of been telling you little bits along the way, but I'm telling you now, this is what's going to happen to me." And uh, and he and he said, "Even one of you is going to betray me. In fact, you're all going to betray me." And and th and can you imagine? from this sense of elation and excitement, wham, in just a few moments, their dreams were broken, shattered. And that's where some of you are. You had this idea, you had this vision, you had this plan. You thought, wow, and then something has come in and bam, totally destroyed that dream and that vision and that plan and you're sitting here listening to my voice with a, a broken dream. Wow. Not only that, but Jesus was telling them what was going to happen in the future. So not only did they have a broken dream, but when Jesus was describing his future, for them it was just hopeless. So here they were in between a broken dream and a hopeless future. And I tell you, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing. I don't think there's a worse place to be. Actually, I've been there on a number of occasions. That's why I'm preaching this with so much passion. And this is the point I'm going to make. When I meditated on this, their dreams were shattered as Jesus told them about his betrayal and death, they looked into a hopeless future. And in this condition, right there, he said, let's go. And the Bible says he led them out into the night. That's another message, the night time. He led them out into the night. And between the upper room and Gethsemane was the Kidron Valley. So they went from a broken dream to a hopeless future through a valley. Wow. And when I started to meditate on that, so here they go, picture it, feel their disappointment. And they're following Jesus down into the Kidron Valley, broken heart, hopeless future. And right there in the Kidron Valley, he stops. And he says, I want to teach you one of the most important lessons you're ever going to learn. And he took a bunch of grapes and he started to teach them the secret of the vine. We all know it. John chapter 15. Hmm. 
And I thought, why? And you know, when I thought about this, here were the disciples in between disappointment of the upper room and the seeming hopelessness of Gethsemane. And right here, Jesus chooses this time to teach them probably the most important lesson they're going to learn. Here they were in the upper room. We can do this. We're going to do this. Man, we're going to, and I'm going to, and Jesus is going to, and that's been shattered. And now he says, hey, listen, he listens. I want you to understand something. I am the vine and you are the branches. And watch, without me, you can do absolutely nothing. Hmm. His subject matter was not about power and status and achievement and success. It was about this personal relationship that was the most important thing they would ever value in their life. Ha. And, and do you know, I, I, I started to meditate. I started to meditate about this. And I began to realize that valleys... The space between a broken dream and a hopeless future, the valleys where some of you are right now, Jesus chooses the valleys deliberately to teach us probably the most important lessons we're ever going to learn in our life. He not only chooses the time, but he chooses the subject. On many an occasion, he would say to the disciples, I can't explain this to you now. Because you're not in a frame of mind to receive it. In the upper room, they're going, rah, rah. We, so they were in a frame of mind. Jesus couldn't teach them the secrets of the vine in that place because they were so full of their own importance. So the dream had to be broken. They had to look into a hopeless future. They went down into the Kidron Valley. And that's the place that Jesus chose to teach them the most important lesson. you know why? Because when we're on the mountaintop, yeah, man, we can do this. Very often, we are, we are the most unteachable. It's when we are broken. It's when we have lost. It's when we have failed. It's when we think we, are, we don't even deserve to be, to be in his company. That's the place when our hearts, when the soil of our heart is the most fertile. Uh, and so I want to encourage you, for those of you that are between a broken dream and a hopeless future, listen, what is God saying to you? What is Jesus trying to teach you? Because the best fruit is grown in valleys. And often when our despair is the greatest, the soil of our hearts are the most fertile. And it's in the valleys. And I'm speaking not just from the revelation of God's word, but also from my own personal experience. It's in the valleys, the space between a broken dream and a hopeless future. That's where we are most teachable, most attentive and most hungry for God. You know, I remember, uh, and you know, I, I, do you know what? I, I, I got so much. There's, there's like, there's like eight aspects to that, to this, and I've just, uh, I'm just touching on half of one. But I, I, I'd rather just, I'd rather just, you know, wind up here than just carry on. Perhaps we can do it again, Josh. Perhaps there's, there's, there's like. Th <laughs> there's like six hours here. Um, th there's, there's not just valleys. There's, in fact, I, I, I wrote down eight, eight aspects of the space between. Uh, let me just give you them, okay, before I wind up. Valleys, the space between a broken dream and a hopeless future. Nights, the space between p.m. and a.m. Watch this. The space between past mistakes and another mess. <laughs> I got a... a a teaching on that. Then there's Egypt, the space between a destiny reversed and a destiny resumed. That's Joseph. Then we will experience silent Saturdays. Silent Saturdays between Good Friday and the resurrection. Silent Saturday 
where it's the space between bad for you but good for others. It looked bad for Jesus on Friday. And the silent Saturday, it looked bad. But no, he was, he was uh, the space between for Jesus, the silent Saturday, bad for him, it looked like, but good for us. And very often, God will allow you. <laughs> he will allow stuff to happen. And you think, why is this happening to me? No, uh, it's a silent Saturday where bad for you, but God is working it good for others. Then there's Patmos, where John was on the island of Patmos, the space between isolation and revelation. Then you have cemeteries. When the women came to the cemetery, and the angel said, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? Cemeteries, the space between hanging on and letting go. Then you have the wine press. I've mentioned it, the space between crushing and celebration. And then eighthly, you have storms, the place between sowing and reaping. So perhaps on another occasion, I can touch on some of these, but I want to finish this uh, aspect of the space between the valleys, the space between a broken dream and a hopeless future, and you are there, and God is saying, God is saying, no, now I can teach you things. <laughs> I couldn't teach you on another occasion. Now your heart is fertile. Now your ear is open because you just don't know what to do. And, and I don't know, it's different for every one of you. I mean, in, 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 when I've been between a broken dream and a hopeless future, um, God has, I've seen things I would never have seen when I was flying high. The church was doing great. The fastest going church in Wales, uh, Ray Bevan, the man of God with power for the hour. Well, I, you know, uh, there are times when, when I've been in the valley, when I thought, what? And that, and I remember on one occasion, I'll finish with this. I remember on one occasion, I was in between a broken dream and a hopeless future, and I'm driving up the motorway, wondering what it's all about. And my friend rang me. He just rang me. Uh, a, a, a friend called Bob Gass, he's in heaven now. And he said, hey, Ray, how are you doing? And I said, oh, please don't give me any happy stuff here because don't give me, please, just your, the fact that you're, you're happy is irritating to me right now. He said, what's the matter with you? And I explained the devastating situation I'd been through, especially the people, watch this, the people, there were lies being said about me, and that, that was okay, I could handle that. But here was my problem. The people that knew me well were believing the lies. And I thought, why are you believing these lies that are being said about me when you know me? And I, I remember saying to God, Lord, why are these people believing these lies about me when they know me? And God immediately came back and said, well, I can relate to that. He said, how, how could a third of my angelic host that I created believe Satan's lies about me and, and rebel. He said, I can relate. I mean, the angels, a third of the angels knew who I was, their creator, knew all about me, yet believed the lie. And it, that was a consolation for me. And I, I was sharing this with my friend on the phone. I said, I mean, I, I can't believe... And, and I'm thinking it's, it's, you know, because of what they are saying now, it'll affect my ministry and I'm going on, I'm crying, I'm in the valley. And Jesus, through my friend, taught me something that probably I wouldn't have grasped when I was on the mountaintop. He said to me, Ray, you need to go down to the potter's house, just like Jeremiah was told Go down to the potter's house. He said, you know the place? I said, yeah, I know the story. And he said, Ray, the, the potter was molding the clay. And he says, and he says, she was molding, just like God is molding our destiny. 
And then the Bible says that the clay, the pot that was being formed, was marred. Something happened. It was marred in the potter's hands. As the potter was forming the pot, something happened to mar it. And he said, it happens in life, right? It happens when God is molding our destiny. Something comes to mar. But he said, listen. He said, the potter didn't take the clay and thought, well, this is useless now. This is, this, is, this is imperfect now. This has been marred. This has been scarred. This has been... Just, so the potter didn't take that lump of clay, throw it away, and, and start again with a new lump. No, he took that marred, hurt, broken, imperfect piece of clay, and he just carried on remolding uh, the picture that he had in his head for that lump of clay in the first place. And he said, Ray, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's marred you. It doesn't matter what's happened to you. God's not going to throw you off the wheel of destiny. The wheel will keep on turning and God will keep on molding until he finishes what he starts. I thought, wow. Now I've read it, but I got it. Because my heart was fertile. Because it made sense at that time. Then he said to me, he said, Ray, who are the people that you are concerned about? Who are the people that are believing the lies about you and saying things about you? Who are the people that you think could, could destroy your ministry? Who, who, who is it? Name them. And I named them. I, I said it this and it's her and it's him. And, and he said, okay, all right. Very influential people, and in the natural, they, uh, their words could have a massive influence on your influence. But he said, Ray, go to the potter again. Have a look under the potter's wheel, and whose feet are turning the wheel? And he said, is it, and he named the people I named, is it so-and-so? I said, no. I said, well, whose feet are on the pedal? that controls your destiny. Is it so and so? I said, no, you went through whole names. And then like a child, he said, well, Ray, whose feet is on the wheel? And of course, with tears in my eyes, I said, it's my heavenly father. And he said, Ray, listen. He said, nobody, nobody has the control over your destiny, however bad it looks. God's feet, God's feet are turning the wheel of destiny and he is remolding. Whatever happens, you will never, ever fall out of his creative grip. Wow. I could never have learned that on a mountaintop. You see, it was between a broken dream and a hopeless future. That revelation was instilled in my heart. The sovereignty of God in my life. That's what you learn in the space between. And that's where some of you may be. Uh, Josh, perhaps we need to do another one of these um, so we can look at some other aspects. Uh, I would love to do that. Um, I love Redemption Church, South Africa and in Holland. I just feel like your granddad. <laughs> I don't like that, but, you know, we have a very special relationship. I believe it's prophetic. Um, I, I believe this is, um, and I believe this word is a now word in the process, um, um, in the space between the, the, that redemption church is right now, the space between where you are right now. I believe this word is prophetic. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to hand back to Josh or whoever's leading the meeting, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the clarity and the passion to preach this message to your church in South Africa and in Holland. Father, we rest in you.
And I pray for those people in between a broken dream, even perhaps this pandemic has caused this. Dreams that have been shattered and futures that seem hopeless. Lord, you are leading us through the Kidron Valley. And right now, I pray you'll help people to be still and listen to what you're trying to teach them. Because it's important. The space between a broken dream and a hopeless future right now. Lord, you've taught me the greatest lessons in these places. So right now, I pray you will do that for people listening. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. I'll hand it back over to whoever's leading the meeting to apply this message. Pray for people. I love you, and I can't wait to see you live. God bless you guys. That was such a powerful word as we gathered today and listened to what we can do to shift the atmosphere of our lives. You know, God has such a desire to be your savior, to walk with you as your heavenly father, to take you through the toughest seasons and to walk you from darkness into light. Wherever you're watching from right now, I have one real simple question to ask you. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? See, you'll never know how to worship God in fullness and in truth until you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'm not talking about a religious decision to join a club or a clique or to become traditional. I'm actually asking you, do you have a living relationship with God through Christ Jesus? The Bible is so clear. In order for us to have Christ save us, all we have to do is request Him to save us. In other words, the Bible says, all who call upon my name will be saved. I wanna lead you in a prayer right now called the prayer of salvation. Simply put, the prayer that asks Christ to save you. Wherever you're watching, however you're watching, don't leave today without declaring Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. It truly is the single most significant thing you could ever do with your life. So let's pray together right now. And if you've never prayed this prayer before, I wanna invite you to pray it with me for the very first time. Let's pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Your blood was shed. Your body was broken so that all my sin and all my sickness can be washed away. I thank you, Jesus, that you have saved me. And today I declare, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the very first time, we really would love to know. We wanna send you a bunch of resource online that tells you more about the decision you've made today and the incredible life you can live with Jesus Christ. Simply comment below if you're watching in social media pages or email the email address listed below. Let us know that you prayed that prayer for the first time today so that we can celebrate with you and give you a whole bunch of free resource to bless you. We're gonna receive communion together right now. And I wanna ask all of you watching, wherever you're watching, to take out your communion elements, some juice and some bread, some liquid and some crackers, whatever it is that can be the blood of Christ to you and the body of Christ to you. If you need a moment to gather the things in your home, simply press pause on this play out and we'll give you time to get what you need. But right now we wanna receive communion together because this is so powerful. How do we shift from worry to worship? Communion is key. See, you do not need to look at your own body and see the sickness. You need to look at the broken body of Christ to see your healing. And so right now we worship God saying, God, even though I'm sick, I can look to you for my healing. That's worship. And we look at ourselves and we might feel down. We might feel discouraged. We might feel like failures. We might feel insecure and like we're unworthy because of how we're struggling through life. But the blood of Jesus allows us to worship God knowing that we are fully accepted and loved because He paid for every single sin. So right now, as we take this cracker, this bread, and we look at it, we see that our Christ suffered for us. And as we break this, we say, this is the body of Jesus that was broken for me. By His stripes, I am healed. And now we're gonna partake together as we receive, thank you, Jesus, healing in our bodies healing in our homes. Thank you, Jesus. We can worship you 
Even if we're struggling with illness, we can worship you and declare we are healed because of what you've done for us. And right now, as we take this juice that represents the blood of Jesus, we speak over it saying, this is the blood of Jesus shed for me. Every sin, every mistake, past, present, and future has been washed away. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And we receive together. Oh, Father, we just thank you that as we come together and we place our eyes on you for what we need, we receive healing and wholeness today. And I want to speak to you a moment about your finances. Something I want to highlight to you is what you do with your finances will show you what you worship. It'll show you where you're placing your hope and your faith. I'm not talking about giving in stress and giving in fear and giving out of manipulation. But truthfully, giving reveals your heart. God wants you to trust Him for your provision. Right now in an absolute crisis, and do you know in the Bible, in times of famine, the people of God sowed. They gave to God of their resource. Why? Because they realized they wanted to worship God, not just with their lips, but actually with their substance, with what they had. Today, I want to encourage you. God is not after your money. God is after your provision. He so loves that you would worship Him with your giving to trust Him for your provision because He doesn't want you walking around with the worry and the burden of your provision. I want to encourage you. This church believes in tithing and giving, not because this church has a budget, but because this church understands the power of what happens when we worship God with our giving. In my life, as Tara and myself are always looking for opportunities to sow and trust God and be generous, we have seen God be supernaturally incredible as a provider for us, regardless of economies, regardless of what's going on. It's absolutely incredible to see the supply of our Lord. It's amazing to see what God does when we worship Him with our finance. Right now, around the world, the world is screaming stress and worry because provision is uncertain. Well, I want to encourage you today. The Bible tells us when we trust God with our giving, provision is certain. Bible even says, God says, test me in this. It's one of the only times in the Bible God says, this is something that will never be broken. Test me in this. Trust me with your substance. And will you not see how much I would open up heaven? In other words, God says, I love it when you trust me with your finance because it allows me to show you that I'm your provider. So as you give today, do it trusting God for your provision. Can we pray together? Father, we thank you that as we serve our tithe and offering today, we do so worshiping Jesus, worshiping our most high God, trusting Him that in the midst of economic uncertainty, retrenchments and, and companies closing and economies collapsing, we will be provided for supernaturally because you are our provider. As we sow our seed today, as we give of our tithe and offering, we do so with our eyes on Jesus, showing the world, we worship our heavenly Father for our provision. We thank you for supernatural provision in every single home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as we give you an opportunity uh, to give, thank you for giving, and we look forward to seeing you again next week here at Redemption Church. Until we see you again, be blessed. <music>